Hi guys, it is a chilly, blustery day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in Austin, Texas, here on this chilly Monday, November 12, 2018, but we're going to head from Austin out to Boulder, Colorado today, where I have the great pleasure and honor of speaking with Brian Toon. And anyone who is not familiar with Brian, Owen Brian Toon is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and a research associate in the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado. He has a PhD in physics from Cornell University and was a research scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center from 1975 until 1997. Brian's research group studies radiative transfer, aerosol and cloud physics, atmospheric chemistry and parallels between the Earth and planets. And he is uh, known best for understanding stratospheric volcanic clouds, stratospheric ozone loss, the effects of aircraft on the atmosphere, which is going to be the basis of this talk. And so without further ado, uh, Brian, come on and say hi to the folks, and then we're just going to dive right in to this conversation. Great. Good to talk to you, Sam. Okay, so... Uh, where I want to go with, with, with this, Brian, and, 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 I, and, and please don't slam the phone down on me, the, the first question out of my mouth. I, I just have to ask this question because so many people uh, on YouTube are, are, are down this rabbit hole and, and you probably know where I'm going. Brian Toon, what is your opinion of the, these people who say, chemtrails are real and that we have been geoengineering this planet for years and all of these things you see up in the sky are some sort of conspiracy to do whatever they're supposed to be doing up there. Can we hear your scientific opinion um, on that? Yeah, I think that this whole chemtrail thing might have originated from a field program that I ran in the late 1970s uh, over uh, Kansas and Texas, which was um, Oklahoma, uh, which was aimed at studying how contrails form behind aircraft. Uh, and uh, people have known a lot about this since the uh, Second World War. And it's a major thing with the military because you don't want to spend all that money on a super secret airplane and what you can't detect and have it make a huge contrail behind it. Um, so we have a pretty good understanding of what makes contrails. So when you look up at the sky and you see these long s streaks of cloud that are, you know, usually straight lines, um, that's usually just the exhaust from a commercial airliner. Um, you know, of course, you wouldn't want to stand right behind an airliner on the ground because there's a lot of engine exhaust there. But mostly what you see is uh, just water. Uh, so it's no more scary than going to your freezer and picking up an ice cube. All it is is a whole bunch of little pieces of ice with some exhaust from an engine stuck in it. Um, it certainly doesn't fall directly on you. I mean, this whole thing doesn't make, uh, chemtrails makes no sense at all because if you look up and you see an airplane flying overhead, they're usually 30 or 40,000 feet above the ground. Uh, the stuff that they're putting out, well, it's going to mostly just evaporate into the air because it's just water vapor. Uh, but if it didn't evaporate, uh, it would um, blow down wind hundreds of miles before it ever got anywhere near the ground. So it certainly isn't falling on you. Um, so I'm not quite sure you know, why people like this chemtrail story, except, you know, just to make money on it. Uh, once I was at a meeting in um, the Colorado mountains, I believe it was in Aspen, and um, there was a big meeting going on there of a couple hundred people trying to figure out issues with airplane exhaust. And of course, none of us were being paid to do this, except as part of our normal jobs. And 
downtown in Aston where all the rich people were. Some nut was giving a talk about chemtrails and getting paid by the rich people to scare them, I guess. Um, you know, so I, chemtrails is just sort of a money-making uh, way of scaring people. It has no factual basis. So all of this stuff about aluminum and barium and secret programs of the military and the New World Order, I, I, I just want to, before we even get into an intelligent discussion, I, I just want to say you, you absolutely, it sounds like, you, you reject all of, all of that stuff. Is that a safe way to sum that up? Yeah, absolutely. I've been on airplanes where we flew around in circles trying to run into our contrails. They, you know, they're made by they're made by airplanes, and we understand exactly what they are. They're ice that's uh, mostly formed mostly just from water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of the upper atmosphere is um, wants to make an ice cloud, but it doesn't have quite enough water in it to do it. And um, so if you pour a little more water in there from the engine coming out of the fuel from the um, engine going through the engines, it makes it a little bit wetter and that makes uh, uh, clouds start to form. And, you know, and once it's formed, you know, then there's plenty of water in the atmosphere that makes it grow and become more visible. So we know exactly what it is. It's coming out of mostly commercial airliners. Um, you can see it sometimes if you go to an air show, you'll see a plane, you know, um, flying really fast and climbing, and it, that makes a little vacuum behind the wings, and kinds of water forms right there. That's a similar kind of a thing. Um, if you ever get behind a commercial airliner very close, well, you probably regret it because <laughs> there's incredible <laughs> turbulence that comes out of the back of airplanes um, that I've flown right up behind them and uh, NASA aircraft and uh, bounced around in the contrails, which uh, on an air, a lot of airplanes have little um, flaps on their wings that kind of tip up, yeah, wing yeah. tips that are, you know, those things make a little tornado behind them. And, you know, so they have an ice tornado that comes out the back if their conditions are right and you can um, see right through it. It's very interesting. So, yeah, so they're just commercial airliners you're seeing, and sometimes the air is dry and they don't make a contrail. Sometimes the air is a little bit wet, and they'll make a one that just lasts for a little while. And if the air is really moist up there, then they'll they'll make a contrail, and it'll shed out and over the day and become a cloud deck. And you know, unless you're watching it and keeping a track of it, you wouldn't even realize yeah. that you're looking at clouds formed by many aircraft. Um, you know, so you, if you watch a contrail, you'll just see it spread out and evolve and look like any other cloud. Okay, well, okay, we're going, we're going to move on, and hopefully, guy, it, 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 people listening to this channel, uh, I, I'm hoping that is going to be the last time I mention chemtrails on this channel, uh, for as long as this channel shall live. Okay, so anyway, let's continue into uh, a, a, a more... I would think a more serious uh, discussion of the effects of aircraft on the atmosphere, and that, of course, is uh, the the geoengineering, the solar radiation management. Uh, so I, I see that you were on this workshop uh, that, that I was that I've been reading about. So obviously you are a man with, with your background, I, who should be a, a knowledgeable source to talk about solar radiation management. Is that is that safe to say? I, I've given it a lot of thought. <laughs> so nobody could be an expert on it because nobody's trying to do it yet. Um, but, you know, I've been in a numerous, numerous groups who've tried to understand what might happen if we tried to manage the climate um, this way. Okay, so let's just get, get, get your opinion on this. First of all, give us a layman's definition of what the most recent, I guess, school of thought is. What, what are you guys studying and talking about potentially doing and like how many airplanes how many tons of this stuff you know the the usual questions that that get people nervous 
what exactly is being bandied about, and then we'll come back and talk about the, per, the ramifications of that. So first, what is it? Well, let's just start with geoengineering. Um, so the idea of geoengineering is that people are changing the climate of the Earth. And so geoengineering is not new. We've been geoengineering the Earth for quite a long time um, in lots of different ways. For example, uh, people are cutting down forests all over the place and converting them into pasture or cities. That's a form of geoengineering. The most obvious form of geoengineering is that people are pumping all this carbon into the atmosphere. And uh, people know that it's bad to pump that carbon in the atmosphere. They know it's going to change the climate. They're doing it on purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, that's changing the earth. Uh, and people don't really quite realize the culprit here you know, or what, what the real problem is, which is uh, putting things into the atmosphere that last a long time. So, for example, um, prior to the 1980s or so, we were using propellants and aerosol spray cans that contain chlorine compounds, uh, which we banned aerosol spray cans there. But uh, then we discovered these same chemical compounds were being used in foam blowing for refrigerators and you know, the compressor fluid and air conditioners and um, things like that, which we banned in the late 1990s. And those compounds last in the atmosphere about 100 years, and uh, they slowly make their way into the upper atmosphere where they get exposed to some harsh ultraviolet light, which breaks the molecules apart, and uh, 30 or 40 kilometers above the surface, the chlorine that's in these things gets released, and um, if it's really cold, which it is the polar regions, it can destroy ozone, and that causes the ozone hole. Um, so that's an example of un, un, unintentional geoengineering. Uh, there's probably yeah, all but, sorts yeah. of unintentional. So yeah. let's talk about the the intentional geoengineering, and particularly with you, I want to uh, talk about what a lot of people are still going to be calling chemtrails. That the solar radiation right. management. What exactly are you talking about putting? in right. to, to airplanes and, 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 and just the t how sure. much of this stuff uh, are we talking about and right. for how long? Okay, well, let me just continue my previous thought for one second okay. here. So 100 years, that was a problem with the ozone hole. Carbon dioxide has a lifetime in the atmosphere ocean system of 100,000 years. So if you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by driving home tonight, which I'll do, that about 20% of that carbon dioxide is still going to be in the atmosphere tens of thousands of years wow. from now. Uh -huh. So we're modifying the Earth on geologic time scales. We're releasing this stuff. It's going to accumulate. Okay, so what, we, what can we do to balance the effects of the carbon dioxide? And, you know, the the best answer is don't put it in the atmosphere because it's really hard to get it out. Um, but one thing that carbon dioxide and other gases like methane are doing is um, raising the surface temperature of the earth. Um, so if, we, if our goal is to reduce the surface temperature back to close to what it is now, one way that nature does this is by throwing from volcanoes sulfuric acid into the upper atmosphere. And we can see that um, the sulfuric acid doesn't last very long. It stays up there uh, for a year or two, and then it falls out. But it reflects some sunlight back to space because uh, it's a shiny, yeah. colorless liquid, looks just like water. And that cools the Earth off a little bit. So that's the idea behind solar radiation management is to do something to reflect some sunlight back to space. Now, you could do something like paint everybody's roof white, um, and some people think that's a good idea, but there's not that many roofs around, <laughs> so it's going to help that much. Uh, but you could put um, sulfur into the upper atmosphere, 
and um, have that convert to sulfuric acid particles. And um, we think at the moment that we would need about 5 million tons of um, sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, and we'd have to put it in about half of it every year, a couple million tons. Um, for reference, everybody on the Earth weighs about 300 million tons, um, so we're talking about putting in a few tenths of a percent of the weight of everybody on the Earth uh, of this stuff into the upper atmosphere. Um, so you can imagine if you're putting in um, a fraction of the weight of everybody in the, in the, on the Earth, you're going to have to carry that much weight in airplanes. <laughs> so uh, you're going to have to have millions of takeoff and landings of tanker-sized airplanes um, you know, the number of airplane flights you need depends on how big the tanker is. Maybe it's 100,000, but it's probably more like a million uh, to carry this stuff up. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you'd like to carry it up much higher than the altitude of a commercial airliner. So there, there, there are not enough high-altitude aircraft mm -hmm. in the world to do this at the moment. Um so there are a whole bunch of problems with this whole thing, and one thing that's nice is it's short-lived. So if you don't like it, you just stop doing it. Um, another thing about it is people probably don't like to hear this, but there's lots of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. It's a major component of smog, and uh, particularly in the eastern coast cities where it's produced from the stuff that comes out of coal power plants. Um, and um, so right now, altogether, um, people are creating like 100 million tons of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere every year by burning coal and petroleum with sulfur in it and oil with sulfur in it and things like that. So we're talking about putting about 1% of this stuff we already put into the atmosphere, in the lower atmosphere, from smokestacks, from power plants and stuff, instead of putting it out of the power plant plume, put it in an airplane and carry it up higher where it will last longer and um, reflect some sunlight back to space and cool the planet off. So one of the, the one thing you mentioned is if we don't like it, we can just turn it off. But one of the th things that I am that, that I've been reading and, and, and you know I'm just a layman, but I do quite a bit of reading on this subject, and I'm reading all the time is we can't just turn it off. That once the toothpaste comes out of the tube, we can't put the toothpaste, if we, if, we, if we try to turn it off, the temperature just like in a period of a couple of, I don't know, weeks or months is just going to skyrocket. Uh, what is, is that a myth? Yeah, well, no, actually, well, in the first place, you can put the toothpaste back in the toothpaste tube. <laughs> in fact, my wife recently did that just to demonstrate <laughs> just it could be done. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, yeah, that's the problem with this and one of the reasons I think this will never happen is that um, people will become addicted to it. Yeah. They'll think, oh, well, we, we don't have to do anything now uh, about releasing carbon to the atmosphere. Yeah. We can just keep burning up all the coal and oil uh, because we can counter it with this sulfuric acid. But the problem is the um, coal burn, the CO2 released from the coal and petroleum, has this 100,000-year yeah. lifetime. Yeah. So it just keeps adding and building up and building up. The sulfate just falls out of the atmosphere and gets washed out by rain. It doesn't build up. So you know, by the middle, by the middle or the end of this century, the carbon dioxide greenhouse effect is going to become so large that we have to start putting a hundred percent. Yeah. of all of the sulfur that we're producing by burning coal into the upper atmosphere. Um, so this is almost certainly impractical. Um, and so even the most ardent geoengineering enthusiasts say, well, you know, sometime late in the century, to keep the planet from getting too hot, we'll have to start removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is possible that that, that, that can be done, but probably very costly. And, um, you know, that 
the, people don't really realize the amount of carbon dioxide they're putting into the atmosphere. The average American's putting about five tons of carbon a year into the atmosphere, not personally, of course, but somewhat through their car emissions, but mostly through uh, industrial processes and power generation. And, you know, so if you put that out there, um, it's going to end up as even more weight because you have to add some other molecules or atoms in there to convert it to some solid form so you can bury it. So you end up having to bury about an elephant or two in your yard somewhere every year to keep up with these emissions. Um, so I don't have a small yard, but it isn't big enough for burying a lot of elephants. Uh, and in fact, the average person on the earth, the the area that each person has to share around the world is only about two football fields. Uh, you know, and that includes some yeah. Antarctic ice and some uh, glaciers and some deserts and uh, some trash dumps in your house and where you grow your food and everything else. Uh, so trying to bury a bunch of elephants out there is uh, not going to be that easy to do. Um, so uh, trying to take this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bury it somewhere, uh, it might be possible to do it but it isn't going to be easy to do it. Um, so better just to not put it up there in the first place. Uh, so there's a lot of other problems with this uh, idea of countering the greenhouse effect with geoengineering. So one of them is that carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean. And um, unfortunately, it makes it an acidic solution. It's like Coca-Cola or you know, that's what happens with the bubbles that are coming out of your yeah. Coca-Cola or whatever carbonated drink you like is carbon dioxide that's in, in there in the drink, which eats up your teeth. Uh, it's an acid. And uh, if you put it in the oceans and it builds up, it'll start eating up all the shells of um, little creatures in the ocean um, and destroy coral reefs. Um, so that's another problem with the solar management idea is that it it doesn't stop that. It doesn't prevent the ocean from becoming acidic. Um, and uh, so that's something one has to deal with somehow, um, the acidity of the oceans from the rising CO2. Uh, the other problem you have to deal with here is that um, if you want to do geoengineering, um, you have to um, uh, have a um, international set of agreements to allow this to be done, and there are probably people who don't want the Earth to stay as cool as it is. You know, for example, the largest country in the world geographically is Russia, which is a very high latitude country. A lot of it's frozen, um, you know, difficult to deal with, and uh, I'm sure that they would be happy to have it warmer. Uh, they'd probably be happy to have a huge coastline on the Arctic that was ice free where they could um, tap the resources of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and, you know, so the probability that you could get the world to agree to geoengineering is not very great in my view. Um, so why are scientists thinking about this? Uh, and the reason is that um, there is some concern that um, politicians will fail to act and um, solve this problem, um, and uh, that the Earth will start experiencing um, problems because of the warming temperatures that um, you know that we probably will have even more forest fires than we're having now. We'll have a longer period of time when there are forest fires, um, and uh, we'll have more intense hurricanes. As far as we can tell, um, because of the warming ocean surface temperatures. Um, but the worst thing that could happen is that we could start warming the polar caps enough that um, they will start melting significantly, and the Earth normally doesn't have polar caps. So if you go back through geologic history in the last 600 million years, 
when complex organisms have been on the planet, 90% of the time there haven't been any polar caps. Uh, and if you take all the ice out of Greenland, you get about 15 feet of extra sea level. That will eliminate the state of Florida. Uh, if you take the Antarctic ice, you'll end up with 300 feet of extra sea level, which will eliminate a large fraction of the oh, United wow, States. Yeah. Uh, you know, and as it is, people in Miami are experiencing problems with flooding. Uh, I was recently in Venice, Italy, you know, which is a really beautiful but very surprising place. There's no cars there. It's an island, uh, a series of islands, and all the houses are about two or three feet above sea level. Uh, you know, they periodically already have flooding where the whole place floods. Uh, you know, that, that city is going to disappear. Uh, and that's the fate of most of the coastal cities around the world, that they'll become flooded. Perhaps not in the near term. Um, the best predictions we have at the moment are that by the end of this century, the sea level will be about three feet higher than it is now, which is mostly because of thermal expansion, because the temperature is getting warmer. Um, and, you know, the, the you know, so that's going to be not very good for lots of places in um, Florida, for example, in Louisiana. Uh, you know, so the, the ice caps aren't going to melt overnight. It may take hundreds or even thousands of years for them to melt. But many people are concerned that once you start them melting, you won't be able to stop them. Uh, you know, the Earth obviously is perfectly happy to not have polar caps. And, uh, and you know, if they start melting and we can't just stop what we're doing and have them recover, then we will have set in process something that will, you know, destroy all of our cities over the next centuries. And um, so that's one reason that people are thinking about this geoengineering thing is that, you know, they are afraid we'll get into a position where the politicians and um, people who should be solving our problems are not, and that we'll lose control of the system, the climate system, and uh, there will be an emergency on the planet of, you know, trying to stop things before they get any worse. And uh, geoengineering then may be the last possible way you can stop things from getting worse. So do you think it's, uh, I, I've been predicting for years that it, to me it seems like it's a, for, it's a foregone conclusion that uh, it's going it, it's going to happen uh, yeah. sooner or later. There, there's just with the way things are building on this planet. Do you think at this point it is a foregone conclusion that we're going to go this direction? Uh, you mean warming? No, no, no. Uh, towards the geoengineering, particularly the solar well, radiation management, is there in, any way that we're not going to end up going down this? Oh uh, yeah, I'm. I'm still optimistic that. Um, you know, politicians will realize that um, climate change is real. I mean, you know, every person, you know, anybody who has spends any time outside over their lives knows that the planet is getting warmer. You know, you can see it from satellites. You take pictures of the oceans and the Arctic. The ice is going away. Um, you know, it's, it's warming faster in the polar regions than anywhere else. And you know, just in the 20 years I've been living in Boulder, you know, it doesn't snow very much in May or September anymore. Uh, you know, the yeah. length of the growing season has gotten longer because the planet's a little warmer. Um, you know, the winters are milder than they used to be. Uh, you know, I think almost everybody um, can tell this just in their own well, lives. There, there's one man the who's not aware apparently. of it. Yeah, there's, there's one man we all know who's completely unaware of it, apparently, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unfortunately, he's in a pretty big power of uh, position of power on the planet, and he is the number one global warming denier of them all. So, yeah, I, I don't really think that uh, a lot of people who I mean, it's become a religious thing or something. You know, I mean, it's uh, if you belong to a certain club, then you have to say, "Oh, I don't believe in global warming." And um, I, I don't know why this club wants to believe that, uh, but I don't think a lot of the people in that club actually do believe it. Uh, I think they just, uh, you know, it's 
like you're walking down the street and somebody uh, you know asks you questions about certain things. You know, you feel like, well, I have to give them this answer, yeah. or they're going to be mad at me or something. Um, you know, so you know, I, I don't. You know, you can't live in Florida, for example, and, and you know the governor there denies climate change is happening. Well, Miami is getting flooded all the time, and the place is getting hit by hurricanes over and over again. You know, so they, you know that's just uh, some sort of uh, denial of reality or something. Um, but nevertheless, uh, not everybody denies reality, and eventually um, it will become impossible to ignore it. It already is impossible to ignore it. You have to do look at temperature records or pictures of the Earth from space and see all that ice disappearing um, and all the glaciers going away and uh, on the Earth. Um, but, you know, if you don't choose to do that, eventually you'll nevertheless going to find out that this is true. The Earth and the w world really has very little interest in what people think. It's going to do <laughs> what it's going to do because of physics, no matter what we think about it. Um, and the concern is, uh, will we will we admit to the reality of what's going on soon enough to, to just get rid of the carbon so that the problem goes away on its own, or we're going to have to intervene with some um, extreme measure like geoengineering? Okay. Well, as I, I could easily make this uh, my my full hour interview, Brian. But we need to uh, we're we're going to have a whole other discussion in a minute. But I do want to touch on one thing. Uh, what is your opinion of of the whole global dimming thing? Uh, that the the amount of soot and particles that we are putting into uh, the atmosphere, ironically enough, by burning uh, fossil fuels such as coal, and that the more we fix, quote, air pollution, the more that we're successful in the war against that, we could actually be increasing global warming by taking our own industrial pollutants out of the air. Is that a big enough factor? to actually affect global temperatures, in your opinion? Is that a valid fear, or is it an overblown? Well, um, in 2013, I um, led a NASA field program based in Houston uh, using a couple of large NASA aircraft, and we flew around the southeastern U.S., and actually in part of the western U.S. as well, looking at smoke. So we flew around the southeastern U.S. looking at the um, amount of um, sulfur there and the amount of uh, other yeah. chemicals that were released from um, industrial um, things and uh, power plants, and they've gone down strikingly. Um, so the United States put emissions controls on um, sulfur dioxide emissions and nitrogen oxide emissions and things like that, largely because of acid rain. Um, about 20 years ago, and those abundances of those things have fallen dramatically. And so the United States has become much cleaner. If you go to Los Angeles, it's um, much cleaner than it was, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, things are getting worse in the West because of all the fires that we're having, so there's a lot more smoke in the summer. But generally, the United States is cleaning its act up. Um, and uh, But the rest of the world... Well, Europe has also done the same thing. But there are significant problems going on in China and India. Yeah, those are the two and, main ones. Yeah. And so th those are the major emitters now. Uh, so we're kind of at a point, I think, where we will be reducing all those emissions globally. Uh, you know, the Chinese are, you know, it's, it's estimated that a million Chinese die every year early, prematurely, because of all the air pollution, which is just unbelievable if you're there. And of course, there's still tens of thousands of Americans dying every year because of breathing air pollution from power plants and things like that. Um, so so I think it is true problem, that yeah. as you put on these emissions controls, you'll push down the amount of solar dimming, as you call it, and um, that will make the temperature rise even faster. 
than it has been. So you do agree with that that theory? It's not just some wacky, uh, d d this nope. wacky theory out there. It, 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 so it is a real phenomenon in your. It, it is a real thing that if you the air pollution is reflecting light back to space and cooling the planet, which is going the opposite direction from the global warming from um, greenhouse gases. And, you know, the air pollution has a really short lifetime, it's only a week or something like that. Um, so every week, the air pollution emitted globally, you know, it counters a significant fraction of the greenhouse warming from the yeah. beginning of the industrial era hundreds of years ago. Um, and, uh, and the air pollution has such a short lifetime, we're eliminating it because nobody wants to breathe it. And that allows the greenhouse gases to heat the planet even faster. Wow. Uh, 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 okay, I, I am so happy I remember, I remember to touch on that. But, but Brian and the people listening to this interview, we are going to uh, so radically change the what we're taught. Well, I guess there are some dots we'll mention in between this conversation and the next one. But we're going to so radically change this conversation in the second half that what I have decided to do is actually divide this podcast into parts one and two. So I'm going to wrap up part one here, and Brian, just just stay with me on the phone, and I'm going to I'm going to wrap up part one, and then we're going to come back with part two of this two-part interview, and we're going to talk about um, Brian. Uh, Brian's work uh, with the nuclear weapons, uh, talking about nuclear weapons, their threat to the planet, and what we can do about that threat uh, here in a minute. But we're going to come back in one minute. But Brian, I really do appreciate your input on this subject, and just hang with me, and I'm just going to restart this, and we'll come back in one minute with part two. Okay? All right. All right, back at you guys. Hold on. Give me a minute to reset things. Bye, guys.